Every year, several thousand seismic tremors shake the Earth. Most of them occur in uninhabited areas. People are affected by only a few of them. Here at the National Earthquake Institute in Denver, Colorado, seismic data from all over the world is collected and analyzed. The number of tremors capable of producing damage to our cities is in the dozens. Fortunately, only a few cause major catastrophes. The least frequent earthquakes are those registering over eight on the Richter scale. One or two may occur on an annual basis, and their consequences are devastating. Predicting them is one of 21st century science's greatest challenges. It is just so complicated and so many variables that it is almost impossible at the present time to be able to forecast and predict earthquakes. And a lot of money was being spent in the United States and they thought it would be better spent working on mitigation and trying to build buildings and be able to build these buildings so they will not collapse when the earthquake occurs. We live on fragile plates that are constantly moving. It's not a coincidence that the east coast of South America and the west coast of Africa look like pieces of a jigsaw puzzle. For many years, it was thought that this was just a whim of nature. Scientists believed that continents were solid, immobile masses. The German Alfred Wegener, with his theory of continental drift, was the first to posit the contrary. That was in 1915. Wegener observed that the geological characteristics of the continents, which were located miles apart, were actually very similar. For example, the Appalachian Mountains in the eastern part of the United States seemed to fit perfectly with the Scottish Highlands. He realized that the rocky strata of the Karoo system in South Africa was remarkably similar to the Santa Catalina Range in Brazil and he found fossils of tropical plants on the Isle of Spitsbergen, near the Arctic Circle. Wegener's intuitive deductions led to hard proof, but unfortunately this inquisitive German scientist would die in 1930 before anyone would recognize the gravity of his discovery. He hadn't managed to uncover the existence of shifting continental plates, a discovery that would not arrive until later. Today, however, we know without a doubt that the continents have been on the move throughout history, and that they are still creeping slowly but surely on, and that they will continue to do so for millions and millions of years in the future, perhaps even after mankind has come and gone. The system underlying the displacement of these enormous supercontinental platforms was set forth in the 1960s in the theory of tectonic plates. The Earth's lithosphere, that is the rigid layer that makes up the planet's surface, is not continuous. It is fragmented and divided into various units. These are the so-called tectonic plates. There are seven large tectonic plates then a number of medium-sized ones and a dozen or so smaller plates of lesser dimensions have also been identified. These plates do not necessarily just consist of continental crust or even oceanic crust. There are plates whose limits include oceanic crust, or rather some of the oceanic lithosphere and the continental lithosphere. This means that a given plate might be made up of, say, the North American continent and also part of the Atlantic or Pacific Ocean. Two hundred and fifty million years ago, the plates comprising Earth's lithosphere formed one enormous continent, known as Pangaea, 
or Gondwana land. By studying the displacement of land masses since then, the tectonic plates theory allows us to foresee future changes in the Earth's physiognomy. The Mediterranean Sea, for example, is expected to narrow until Africa and Europe are one. Africa will divide into two different continents. An ocean will separate them. Australia will drift ever closer to Asia. Tectonic plates are closely related to seismic activity on Earth. In fact, the positioning of the continental platforms determine where earthquakes are most likely to occur. An area known as the Circumpacific Circuit, for example, is a source of 80% of all our planet's seismic activity. The eastern coasts of the Japanese islands are particularly vulnerable. Catastrophes such as the earthquakes in Tokyo in 1923 or Kobe in 1995 form part of the indelible collective memory of the Japanese nation. Seismic activity around Kobe, for example, which is some 500 kilometers southeast of Tokyo, is subject to maximum scientific analysis. The region has been mapped millimeter by millimeter and is home to the most sophisticated measuring equipment in the world. Scientists believe that they would be able to detect any threatening seismic activity sufficiently early so as to evacuate endangered population centers. But they were wrong. On the 18th of January, 1995, a prestigious convention was held that brought together leading Japanese and American seismologists. While they debated the ways they might assuage the effects of destructive seismic activity, a disaster occurred. An earthquake measuring seven on the Richter scale shook the city like a toy. The catastrophe left 6,000 people dead. It destroyed buildings, ripped bridges apart, turned highways into crumpled chaos. The elevated bullet train, a symbol of advanced Japanese engineering, was ripped apart in no less than nine places, despite the fact that it had been designed to withstand seismic shocks of even greater magnitude. The attendees to that conference certainly never imagined that they would be so disgraced as to have to work in such horrifically authentic conditions. <laughs> We knew there was activity, internal displacements occurring in Kobe and in the surrounding areas. But no system or person could have foreseen that that was going to happen on that day, at that moment in 1995. Because in Japan, there's always a lot of seismic activity. And it is very difficult to determine exactly which particular manifestation is going to cause an earthquake, especially like the one that occurred that day in Kobe. Japanese seismologists 